Welcome to Zambition, the channel on which we engage in dialogue with leaders from across sectors and generations. and welcome to Zambition. My name is Martin Kalungubanda, your host on this channel. In this episode, I am privileged to speak to two people whose entrepreneurial skills I deeply admire. Our first guest is Mara Jeanne Michello. Mara is a social entrepreneur she has other areas of specialization that include communications, business development, and project management. Mara is the founder and country director for Jacaranda Hub, an organization that aims at developing young people through the promotion of collective services, specialized tools, and equipment for common use among young entrepreneurs. Mara is also the administrator at Payment Association of Zambia, a joint industry platform from which members who are mainly digital finance services providers are able to collaborate. Mara, welcome to Zambition. Thank you so much for having me. I am a fan of the program, so it's such an honor and Quite exciting to be featured on the program today, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Our next guest is Chiwamba Kanyama. Chiwamba is the founder and managing partner at Bridges Limited, a consulting firm based in Lusaka. Previously, Chiwamba worked at the International Monetary Fund (IMF) as communications advisor. And prior to that, he was director general at the Zambia National Broadcasting Corporation. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in mass communications with economics from the University of Zambia and a Master of Science in Development Finance from Reading. Chibamba is currently finalizing his PhD work. Chibamba, Welcome to Zambition. Thank you very much. And uh, good, morning, good, good evening, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you. My first question to both of you is, what are the one to two experiences in your life's journey so far that you suspect may have shaped you the most into the person you are today? Mara. So I'll start with the first one, um, and, I, and I think this one shaped me even from a very young age. Um, when I, I, as soon as I completed my school, my high school and my A levels, I went and started working for a lot of profit organization. So you can imagine the inexperience, the little that I knew, the, the ambition, the the passion that I had. I took all of that and told myself I could do pretty much anything and everything. Um, much to my disappointment, I found that I was ill-equipped to take on some of the work and the demand of the work because I had not trained um, and I wasn't mature enough as, an in, as a young lady that is coming straight from high school and going into the job market to work for a not-for-profit organization that had um, both local and international standards that you know, they were implementing within the organization. So the first most critical lesson, and I've taken this throughout my career, is it's not personal. When someone throws a document at you because it's poorly done, it's not personal. 
its work. And, and I think I've seen this in a lot of young people. They take um, a lot of advice that is thrown at them in whatever package. They take it so personal that it can actually blind them from seeing the possibilities of growing in an environment. Um, the second lesson for me has never give up. Um, I think as people, we give up sometimes at the very point when we're about to pivot, at the tipping point when we're just about to now break even, when we're about to break into our space, we give up almost at the very hour when we're supposed to sustain, you know, stay, stay focused, sustain ourselves, our energies, so that we see something through. Do not give up until you know that you've reached the level of success that you had planned. Do not give up until you know that you've achieved, um, you know, a task, you've completed it. Do not give up until you know that you've reached the finish line. Do not give up. And that requires you understanding what the finish line looks like. So defining what success is for you will help you understand how far, how long and how much you should, you know, invest your energy in something and see it through. So those for me have been very key lessons that I carry through my work even up to today. Mara, for the second one, um, never give up. Is that something you learned as you were creating or setting up Jakaranda Hub? Yes, because I promise you, I could have given up so many times, um, but I kept pushing, I kept forging ahead. And what I found that at every stage of you know, um, growth, there was a silver lining. So what that helped me was then understanding what success looked like, because sometimes you tell yourself, I will know I'll be successful when I, when I reach $10 million. So you reach $10 million, now what? What I know about growth and transition is that when you reach a certain target and a certain goal, there comes a demand for you to then elevate your thinking, change or improve your environment, understand how many more people can you impact. So I could have given up. So many times I told myself, why don't I just go back and find work? Let me be employed after all. I'll get much more um, money from, from um, you know, getting employed in, a, in an international organization. So... I reached a point where I knew why I was here, what my purpose was, and what I needed to do for me to reach even this level of growth. Running j for five years, I can safely say that we have reached so many milestones, and I wouldn't have reached this far um, and building the team that we have now if I'd given up so many years ago. So yes, um, j I can safely say it's taught me patience and tenacity and also consistency. So we're still here. And I must acknowledge, Mara, I have met some of the young people who have passed through your hub. Thank you for the work you are doing in the country. Thank you so much. Remember, what are the two significant moments that may have shaped you the most into the person we are meeting here today? First of all, the divorce, my parents divorced when I was four years old. Um, I remember how it all happened, uh, how my father wrote a letter and put it on a tree for my mother to read, uh, asking her to leave with all the children simply because uh, somebody else was coming into the house, into the family, he was marrying another woman. And my mother took us all to our grandmother's place. And I remember that moment, four years old. And growing up, I had to show that I wasn't rejected. I wasn't rejected. I had to work hard to prove a point. And I'm calling it to prove a point that even if I was rejected as a kid and my siblings, I was going to make it in life. The environment was bigger. And indeed, that shaped me in a very big way. And two, it's the, the Shivening Scholarship, the Shivening Scholarship, the way they call it, to go to the UK to study at the University of Reading, uh, MSc in Development Finance. That was my dream. I, I remember I had many offers to go under the Shivening Scholarship to go to University of Manchester to do economics, uh, MA in economics, and an MBA at Cardiff. But I said, 
the finance is where I want to be. Investment banking, banking is where I want to be. That had been my dream from the time I left University of Zambia, working for ZNBC, starting a, a different business programs, interviewing uh, many investors and investment analysts, bankers. It, it just got me right. So it shaped me in a very big way. Thank you. Tiramba, thank you so much for sharing about your background, particularly the age of four, to come through to who you are today and what you are doing, not only in our country, but across the world, is an amazing story. You both have distinguished yourselves, not just as entrepreneurs. You have also demonstrated your capacity to help particularly young people so that they find their calling in life. What is it that draws you to working with the young, the entrepreneurs, budding or already emerged? Mara. Um, I think I see myself 12 years ago, um, you know, um, growing up and seeing things that I wanted to change in my environment but didn't have the capacity, I realized that I have a role to play in creating a very conducive and favorable environment for young people. It's one thing to identify problems, but it's another to expect that somebody else is going to fix those problems. I've always been one person who believes that I have the capacity and the capability to change my environment, to change my community, and to change my country. So for me, it's more of service. I know what my purpose is, and my purpose is service-driven. It's knowing that with my tenacity, with my you know, um, ability to create great networks, not just in my country, I should create a pipeline and a pathway for others. If I should, I can lift 10 people up and improve their lives, improve you know, their, their outlook on life, then I know that I can die knowing that I would have changed something in my community. So for me, it really has been um, a call to action that has been driven from seeing my environment, visiting other countries. That's why I love travel. Visiting other countries and seeing what's working in other countries and asking myself, why don't we have this in my country? Why is Zambia lagging behind in this area? Why can't we change the narrative in our country? I love my country so much. And for me, the first place to fix or to build or to correct, to improve, improve and empower is my country. So I want to be able to be an inspiration to young people and for them to be able to point and say, she did something positive in our environment and our community. That, that is my, my big why. And I love the fact that you say you put yourself in the shoes of the young people. And then you connect that with your purpose, your purpose in life, and you call that service. What a beautiful connection there. Chibamba, why? Why are you spending so much time, energy, and expertise? Um, you could be sitting in Washington, D.C. like you did and be there, work with the big boys in the economic uh, field. Why are you doing this? Uh, it, it's based on my personal philosophy, which I crafted many years ago. And it says, you can always become what you have always wanted to become through your children or through your grandchildren. In simple terms, uh, as a country, we won't achieve it all in our time. Some of us won't see Zambia become like Malaysia or Singapore. We may not. However, we can be part of that creation, that journey of the Zambia of the future. But the journey starts now. It's, it doesn't happen abracadabra. The future is a product of what we do today. So my personal inclination is the, the, the future of Zambia, the dream I have about Zambia, 
can only be created if we do something now and invest that in the generation coming after us. And that defines my motivation to inspire many young people because I know that the future is a creation of what we do today to the young people. And we can always become our dream through those in whom we invest our time and our energies, including our financial resources. Thank you. Chamba, you're saying Zambia might not become that dream country we know we are capable of becoming, and yet you want to do something that we will not do that in our lifetime. No, like but that. you want to do something that will help that to be realizable when we are long gone. But Absolutely. some people say, and generally about uh, um, Africans, that we don't think long term. We do not build cathedrals in which we will never pray. We do not build bridges over which we will not drive. Is that assertion correct? Because you are speaking something that contradicts that criticism achievement cultures of the world. And you have spoken so well about most of those cultures yourself listening to, to you. Um, the achievement cultures um, and most of the achievement cultures tend to be futurist, futuristic. They tend to plan for the future. They invest and they save money. Savings is not because you want to consume now. Savings is a product of the future. And much of development anywhere in the world is a product of the amount of savings people commit. Unfortunately, our culture, and, and I want to be very careful here because I'm, in the same book, I'm arguing against myself. And I'm saying, when we say our culture, I'm talking about this culture in which we are in, this disoriented culture, not the culture of our forefathers. Mm -hmm. uh, the culture of our forefathers apparently was very futuristic, they were able to anticipate things. And that's why they were always saying, you will bury me. That phrase, I want my children to bury me. They are simply saying, I want to do as much as possible in my children so that when I die, I live a future. That's all they are saying, I live a future. Unfortunately, our culture is somewhat disoriented. We are too much consumption um, oriented. We want to, to show off our wealth, we want to, to eat now, we want to steal now. We don't think about what will happen once we are gone. I love the way you are making a distinction between what some people accuse us of not having long-term vision and what our culture has created departing from our forefathers and mothers. You are saying our forefathers and mothers had the capacity and action to serve for the future they will not live in. Thank you for clarifying that for me. Mara, what is your ambition? What is your highest aspiration for our country? Um, so for me, um, the highest aspiration is looking at the youth dependency on employment via government, um, on um, employment via you know, corporate companies such as banks, mines. I would like to see an environment in the near or far future where Zambia has a very big and strong economic emancipation that's driven by young people under the age of 35. And I want to see a future where Zambia is utilizing up to 70% of its resources, because even if we make 50% of our natural resources, Zambia would be the hub of economic um, you know, growth and, and um, just a giant in the economic sector, because we have so much as a country that has been given to us, granted to us freely, you know, by, by God, but we are underutilizing that. Um, so I want to see a future where government, private, you know, public and private sector can meet at a point where we start to convert, um, you know, the resources into viable products and services, where young people can see themselves developing and innovating and creating ideas that will utilize and therefore create employment for each other and um, basically just re reduce the 
dependency on international um, support from countries like China. Um, I believe that some of the work that is being done by foreigners in this country should really be driven by the locals. So localization of resources, localization of you know um, access to finance, all of this has to be first and foremost driven by the local people. That's what I want to see because I see the potential and I see it through the eyes of many you know countries within the continent and I'm thinking there's no reason why we should be um, dependent on aid. There's no reason why our you know employment rate should be so low. And there's no reason why our social dependency is very high because we have the resources. What that requires is proper policy and policy enhancement and, and enforcement. What that requires is the young people of Zambia waking up and realizing that they have such a huge role to play and the entitlement, the massive dependency on, on handouts comes to an end in a way that young people start to see themselves as the, as the key drivers of our economy. That is the Zambia I dream of. That is the Zambia I believe we are working towards. We you know with some of the work that Mr. Chamba Kanyama himself does, it starts with the mindset and mentorship has been helping to shift the minds of young people so that they start to see themselves as that active ingredient that adds value to the growth of this country and not seeing themselves as, you know, we are the, the, the smaller uh, or the weaker part of the, demo, the demographic, um, you know, setting. When you look at the population of Zambia, it's mostly 60 to 70 percent youth. Where are the youth of Zambia today? I love the way, Mara, you are weaving, weaving things from, let's, realize what we have just in the boundaries called Zambia. We cannot just look up to the big businesses, the mines, the banks, the manufacturing companies that come with a lot of resources from outside. There is enough for our young people and everyone to do something in order to improve their lot and the lot of those around them. But you couple that with the need to reform, to shape appropriate policy or policies that truly are supportive of allowing the entrepreneurial spirit of our young people to emerge and thrive. Chibamba, what is your ambition, your highest aspiration for our country? And what do you think tends to stand in the way? I strongly believe very much believe in one Zambia, one nation. Mm. Um, those who coined that phrase had a big dream and they understood why. Um, and every day, every day, I work towards building that. You know what? We are losing a lot of energy and time competing against ourselves, at times using very uncouth means, whether it's political power, economic power, and at the end of the day, we lose out on a very big opportunity that can only come about through synergizing our strengths. And I'm using the word synergizing our strength. I, I have written extensively and I continue to write to prove and show that Zambia can only rediscover its own capacity, potential, and compete internationally, globally, if it's a people, if the people of this country discover that they apparently have strength, which we can unify, bring together and exploit our resources. We, we, we are Bemba, we are Tonga, we are Lozi, and God in his wisdom enabled us to have different exposures. And those are the exposures that can synergize and help this country harness the, the, our energies to, to exploit the resources and become a very strong part of this country, a united front to compete. So I, I would really say to me, um, Mara has given bigger picture of it. And I would add to that, it can only come about if we are truly one Zambia, one nation without seeing any 
um, differences. Yes, there are those of what we call value differences. Uh, and those value differences are what bring us together. And we can use those to compete. Thank you. One Zambia, one nation. The job of trying to unravel the potential of this country, Chibamba is saying, cannot be done by a dismembered society, dismembered around tribe, maybe lack of uh, quality education, maybe poor health. It can only be done, he says, when we recognize that our differences, our diversity is the same raw material we need to surge forward and surge forward big time. You both alluded, and this is my final question to you both, to that point in life, the end point. When all is said and done, and you have reached that graceful age of above 80, 90, and you are about to pass on, to die, and somehow at that point, you get the luck to look back at your life's journey, at the legacy you will have left behind. What at that point would you like to see, Mara? I want my kids to see my life as a great example and that my name, um, you know, after I'm born, if they walk into a room and say they once lived or once worked a Mara material in this office, that it gives them favor and not fault. I, and I draw that from my father. My father, before he passed on, um, was working at the you know national airports as the MD Arthur Michelo. Um, he died when I was eleven. But one thing that has been consistent about that name is that everywhere I have gone, where they knew him or someone that interacted with him, they have so much you know. They have a lot to say. They hold him even up to now very high esteem. For me, it was a huge challenge, a huge challenge that told me your name, your name is such a valuable piece of your life and you can never, you know, take it lightly. Your name holds so much power that it will open doors, it will, you know, open conversations if you uphold it. And I think it's something that a lot of our young people have lost. Your name comes with so much power. So you have a very huge responsibility to uphold that name because it's a generational gift. So it shouldn't end with me. My kids should be able to pick up this name and do good with it. So I hope that my name will be spoken positively um, in, in rooms and it will help my kids understand the kind of person that I was and my grandchildren especially. Um, that they get to understand the kind of person that I was and that I did add value to this um, ecosystem, to this country and to this world. Our names matter. Chwamba, what would you like to see at that end point? First of all, I see that my coffin will be bought by some young people I have never met, I would never have met in my life. My own coffin, they will, they will simply say, that old man there, I want to buy the coffin. Another one will say, that old man who's just died, I want to contribute towards uh, whether it's Memorial Park. Another one will say, me, I want to feed the mourners and everything else. Uh, and others will say, did he leave any grandchildren, by the way? We were, are they in school? <laughs> we want to take over the fees for his grandchildren. Um, and these are people I would never even have met, but they, they, we have crossed paths through maybe what I say, maybe what I write. Um, what I want to see really at the end of the day is that those young people who come forward would have really succeeded in life. Uh, it's not about me. I'll tell you that I don't really have much myself because I commit my resources, I commit my time to young people because I know one day, like our forefathers and our foremothers used to say, they'll bury me well. So we are investing in them because I know 
this young generation who have so much strength at the time, a lot of knowledge and, uh, and empowered, capacitated to undertake ventures all over the world, investing in the mines, we would no longer be talking about first quantum minerals and everybody debating KCM, Vendata. It will be about our own indigenous young people now who are mature, have known the world, we have exposed them how to take risk. And these are the ones who, who want the capital to grow this economy and investing in other parts of the world. And that is where I want to be, in their back cover of their books. Thank you. Young people. The young people who turn up on my funeral will reveal the kind of life I lived, what mattered to me. What a beautiful way of capturing the legacy. Mara and Chiwamba, I can't thank you enough, not just for the conversation we have had, but for the work you are doing. You are doing in the country. You are doing beyond the borders of our country because your websites, your stories are read beyond our national boundaries. You are not just inspiring young people. You are also inspiring all of us, those of your age and older than you. I can't thank you enough. Keep on doing what you are doing. Expand that. Let it reach every young person across our country. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much for having us. Having listened to the dialogue and followed my conversation with our guest, I now invite you to look at the drawing that emerged out of that dialogue. Take time to see the contours, the colors, the images that are reflected on the painting, on the drawing and pay attention to what the drawing evokes in you. What are the feelings? What are the thoughts that are ignited by you looking at the painting? What thoughts does the painting generate in you with regard to your own leadership? What thoughts, feelings, and images does this painting evoke in you with regard to the future of our country? What else does this painting make you think and feel? Kindly share your reflections on this channel so that we can continue the dialogue on the future of the country we all love, on the future of our nation. Thank you.